but we've got a local hero in Josh Porteous, who was born and bred on the northern beaches of Sydney, not too far away. He went to the University of Western Sydney and he did a master's in international business. So he would have liked to have gone to that UN festival as well. He spent 12 years in the corporate world and I'm not going to tell you too much because he's going to tell you his story, but he now runs an international NGO, non-government organisation, called the International Brothers and Sisters House, operating through Asia and Africa. But that's not all. He also owns and operates two local businesses, Bare Naked Bowls and Trek for Change, to um, support these charity charities. He's married to Ashley, who is here and jet lagged after coming back from the US this morning. And they have um, a gorgeous little daughter, Indy. Um, and he tells me that he loves to read, cook, stay fit, play as much sport as possible, and he admits that he is a little bit OCD. So I'll just make sure that everything is clean for you up here and um, welcome up, up to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Josh Porteous. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate that. And thank you, BBP, for giving me the opportunity to tell my story tonight. Tom, I really love that talk, mate. That was sort of spot on in the, the area that we're certainly in at the moment. So before I get into, um, I guess, talking about my time at Coca-Cola, it kind of starts before that. I, um, I, I, I failed school and didn't get into university, although Amanda said I did go to university, but that was a lot later on. So I failed school, uh, didn't go into university, went travelling like a lot of young 18-year-olds until about the age of 21. And let me go through this really quickly because I've got about 12 minutes. Um, when I got back at 21, I completely just uh, got lucky and fell into a job at Coca-Cola Amatol. Started as a merchandiser on the Northern Beaches. Um, they're the ones that put me through university and finished in a number of different commercial uh, marketing, sales, uh, people and, and project management roles uh, in, in 2012. And look, I was, um, I was absolutely immersed in my company and being in a large organisation. I enjoyed the political side of it and I enjoyed working towards my next promotion, bigger house, bigger car. And that was really me thinking inwardly and what was next for me. And, um, you know, I was a bit of a... Uh, uh, what's the word? I, I don't think I was a very good person back then in 2012. All I cared about was myself and what, what was next for me. So I had this, um, and it had been chipping away at me for, for a couple of years, um, is, is, is this what it's all about? You know, working in a large organisation, I had the house, I had the car, I had the partner, but was I truly happy? And I had this moment in Manly, just walking down one Sunday afternoon, and I thought, no, I'm not truly happy. And I had this, this moment of just insignificance, and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. So on a whim, I, um, I was in a conference in October of 2012 in New York City, a five-star conference, and I decided to go and volunteer in Cambodia in an HIV orphanage. And it was the first time in my life where I'd been surrounded by people that actually cared about other people. I think that's really sad for someone at age 33 to say to themselves, but it was the reality that I had at that point in time. The kids were amazing, fighting all types of, uh, of issues and diseases and being cast aside by their country and working and living in an orphanage. The volunteers were absolutely incredible. Again, people that actually cared for other people. Um, you know, I didn't get that in the corporate world. And Toby, my colleague with Trek for Change, I met him in 2012. He was my roommate and we volunteered at the same orphanage together. And then the carers were another story. You see a couple of them in there. They were. Um, you know, some of their stories are amazing and I'll talk about one of the mamas who really had a, a huge impact on me. Um, and I guess we have a lot of moments in our life but there's, there's a few that kind of truly shape our future and, and who we are. And it was this woman that really kind of did it for me at the end of my three weeks in Cambodia. Um, her name's San Ri. She, um, she, got, uh, she had a husband and, and four boys that she was looking up and she looking after and she built a great family until the Pol Pot regime came into Cambodia in 1979. Um, her and her family were taken to the rice fields and people know the story of, of Pol Pot and what happened there in Cambodia. She lost her husband and uh, all four boys. So she stayed uh, for four years in, in the rice fields and got through it and, and built herself out. And when um, 
when she came out of that environment, she said to herself, all I want to do is give back now. And for 12 hours a day, six days a week, she now works in that orphanage looking after kids that, you know, that the country's totally, you know, cast aside. So I, I was, she speaks no English, but for some reason I completely connected with her and we got by with hand gestures and nods and, and she was an incredible lady. And at the end of my three weeks there, I said, I said to Toby, I, you know, I want to kind of write her a letter or something and someone translated in Khmer for me. Um, and, and I left her a token gesture and I say token because at the time I thought, you know, that's the best thing I can do, I can give her money. So I gave her 250 Australian dollars or 200 American dollars and I asked her not to, um, not to open the letter until I left because I was saying goodbye to the kids. It was emotional enough as it is and I didn't want to, uh, you know, cry in front of anyone, which I'm prone to do sometimes. And she, I got to the end, edge of the orphanage and she came running after me, um, put her hands on my head and, and dropped to her knees and just started bawling. And I did the same thing. So... That to me was my moment of, I can't go back doing anything that I was doing before and live the corporate world that I was doing. So on the plane ride home, and if you can ask anyone that knows me, I'm, I'm uh, an extremist. I, I go to the extreme on everything. So on the plane ride home, I decided to quit my job at Coca-Cola. My boss said, oh, who got you? Did you go to Diageo? Did you go you know, to here or there? And I said, no, mate, I had a moment over in Cambodia and I need to go explore it and, and see what it's all about. So I sold my house, uh, I sold my car, uh, I quit my job and I sold everything um, that I had except for what was in my backpack. And I spent, um, God, I, I left January 2013 and um, got back around sort of middle of 2014 with a trip in between, but I won't go through all those photos, but I worked with a lot of, a lot of kids in a, in a lot of different countries, some of the poorest parts in the world. And there was three reasons why I did it. One was to be absolutely present at the time with the kids to see if I could actually, you know, have some change with them day to day. Two was to write a blog and tell people back home and try and open them to, you know, what I was going through and maybe push a little change. And then three was to, because my business mind never switches off, three was to how can I help these guys in the long term in a, in a sustainable manner and what was the, the, the gap in these developing worlds. So I just want to go quickly into, into three kids and tell their stories. And this was really the birth of, of the International Brothers and Sisters for me. I spent um, my first time with Panakov up in a regional orphanage about two hours out of Phnom Penh. I spent a month with him. And he was the most incredibly diligent and passionate young boy I'd ever met in my life. Then I found out, you know, it was a child rescue centre. Um, I found out that he was heavily abused as a kid. He had an alcoholic father. Um, the father had beaten the mother uh, you know, to a pulp. She was now mentally challenged and removed from the environment. Um, but the father continued to beat them and beat them until the, uh, an American man called Ken came in and removed them from that environment and brought them into the orphanage. And I couldn't fathom, like, how does a kid from that background come out to be this kid here that I'm meeting? Just this incredibly, and he's so intelligent. He's one of the smartest kids in Cambodia. And I thought to myself, I've got to help him. I've got to do something to help this guy. And then there's Perna, and I thought, and this was my first month. I was in Cambodia, and I had, I had 18 months of volunteering to go and working with charities. Um, and then I met Perna Masarani in Nepal, very similar in all the qualities that Panna had. Um, and for me, probably an even worse upbringing. Um, again, an abusive alcoholic father, but he actually watched um, his father machete is mother to death um, and, and his mother you know obviously died and and the, the the father went into prison so and Perna again just came out as an eight-year-old he saw that that sort of devastation in your life but to come out and be the type of kid he was was incredible and then there's Lolita which um, her story blows me away uh, every time I talk to her and I've been back and back and my wife and I have spent so much time in these countries now I know them very intimately. Lolita was, um, she was actually born in prison because her, um, her mum killed, killed her father. Her mum with her boyfriend killed her father while she was pregnant with Lolita. And Lolita was born in prison and spent eight years in prison um, behind bars. And she came out again back into this orphanage, back into a disciplined environment, and she's just an amazing, amazing person. And I tell you these stories because what hit me with these stories was 
how can I help these kids move forward and turn them into the young boys and girls they are now to educated and empowered uh, young men and women that can move their, move their countries forward? And the gap for me in all of this was when they, were, when they finished in the orphanage at grade 12, they were reintegrated into an environment that, that cast them aside and didn't, didn't you know, embrace them at all. You know, maybe a far distant uncle or cousin who was probably going to sell them off. Lolita, Lolita, before we, she came into our home, uh, was going to be sold off to a, to a guy. Her uncle was just going to sell her for money, and that was it. She would have been a mother at 17 and... Um, and, and you know, farming for the rest of her life. And that's not going to help anyone, certainly not these countries, to, to develop. So I launched um, the International Brothers and Sisters House. So we're an Australian um, public benevolent institution um, or Australian NGO that works in Cambodia, Nepal and Tanzania, um, helping underprivileged and orphan children with higher education. We've got um, secondary objectives that we help uh, HIV programs in Africa that we're heavily invested in at the moment, helping 21 families around the Arusha area in Tanzania. And we're also building, um, building schools for, for orphan children as well. Currently, we've got, so we've got 100. Our vision is to help 100 kids over the next five years. Uh, we've currently got, uh, help me out here, 13 kids in Nepal seven kids in Tanzania, seven kids in Cambodia coming on next year, and then 10 more in Nepal as well. So I guess, uh, why am I really here? That's a, that's a great story to tell of me having an epiphany and, and wanting to help others. But, you know, my wife and I, I met my wife in, in Tanzania volunteering, and, um, you know, we've been together ever since. That was August of 2013. And we actually thought we could live in these countries and, and run our charity in these countries, and it just wasn't possible at all. Um, I'd been away for 18 months. I'd lost about 20 kilos because you do get quite sick in developing countries and we just couldn't physically and mentally and emotionally be in these countries anymore. We had to return to the first world. And when you return to the first world, you need, you need money to survive. Um, so we were kind of, and, and Tom touched on it and I was talking to Amanda earlier in the week about it, this profit for purpose. So we actually went into it, we started our businesses purely because we needed to raise funds uh, for our charity. So Ben Acred Bowls is the first business that we did, and, and, I, and my belief is that when you are building businesses that are 100% intertwined into your charity, they are going to work. Um, so we've got Ben Acred Bowls, which is a superfood cafe, and Trek for Change, which is about an adventure for a cause, and I'll talk about them a little bit more. Ben Acred Bowls give 10% of, of our profits uh, to the International Brothers and Sisters House quarterly, and Trek for Change, everything that we do, we view that as our for-profit arm to our not-for-profit. So every adventure that we send people on, there's mandatory fundraising that goes towards our projects for the charity. Um, and I guess when I think about building businesses and my beliefs and certainly my wife's beliefs as well, we want to stay true to a number of things. And the first thing we thought of was how can we add value? How can we look at a gap in the market and add some value to our customers? The second was, and this was huge for us, do not try to be everything to everyone. At our simple cafe down in Manly, we serve acai bowls. Really, really good acai bowls. But everyone in our first few months wanted to put, bake, oh, do you do bacon and eggs? Do you do this? Do you do that? And we said, absolutely not. We serve acai bowls and superfood smoothies and vegan salads, and we stuck to it. And we did a very specific thing, and we did it well. You need to have belief in what you do. I think everyone knows that in the room. Otherwise, you don't do it. Doubts come in, and you fall down. You need to have the courage to make a decision. And I talked to so many people over the last few years in so many different areas, and people talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and they never do it. Tonight I'm talking, but I usually don't talk, I just do. I mean, you know, you get, you know, get shit done, get stuff done. I shouldn't say that. And then for us, the power of a shared experience, and that is taking someone out of this environment, and this was through Trek for Change, putting them in Tanzania, Nepal, or Cambodia, and giving them that experience that my wife has had, that I've had, that Toby's had, and getting them emotionally engaged in our projects. And that really you know, works for us. And then underneath it all, and, and I guess everyone's soul is fed in, in different ways, but for us, you know, does it feed your soul? Is it, is it in line with your, your values as a person and what you want to achieve? Uh, a little bit more on, on Bare Naked Bowls. So we are a superfood cafe serving um, acai bowls, superfood smoothies, uh, raw treats, kombucha on tap, 
um, and uh, vegan salads. Um, but our, pr our primary business is, is superfood bowls, uh, acai bowls. And we sell, that's about 95% of our business. And um, we give 10%, like I said earlier, you know, to, to our charity, which is helping the kids in the countries. Um, I firmly believe, and this is absolutely in line with what Tom said earlier, we have got an engaged and loyal crowd. And let me tell you, most of them are 14 to 25-year-old, uh, you know, young women predominantly, but men as well. We've got a loyal and, enga and engaged crowd because we, they know that 10% of their purchase goes to our charity. And they love sharing that as well. And Instagram is huge for us. Instagram, you know, or organic growth through Instagram is amazing because they love sharing, first of all, our product. You've got to have a great product and it looks great. But they love sharing that, that you know, part of their purchase is going towards a charity and helping kids in, in these countries. Um, financially, we've, we've grown through that. Um, you can see there, we only launched in July of last year. October, this was done a week ago, but October uh, has, has been our biggest month uh, ever. So um, it's been wonderful. We've had a huge amount of opportunities. Um, franchising have come at us, licensing opportunities. Westfield wanted to take us into, into 10 of their, um, their, 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 their centres. And then, uh, you know, an, an Israeli guy came and wanted to buy us out uh, about six months ago. But for us, it was, you know, it was our baby and we wanted to develop it more. Um, and were all those options in line with where we were at as a family and, and, and our values? Um, the second business is very much um, a huge passion project uh, for me because it is directly connected to IBSH and giving people a shared experience in these countries. And I'll just read a little bit here. So we offer all-inclusive, unique, outcome-driven international excursions for individuals, screw groups, and corporate groups. So Ashley, Toby, and I are off to Tanzania in four weeks' time. We're taking 16 kids from St. Augustine's, uh, and we're building two classrooms to add on to a school that we built there last year. So very much immerse them in that culture, and they'll meet all the kids that we're supporting. Um, we've got... Uh, a number of other schools that we're talking to at the moment. Uh, we're doing a leadership program where we're pitching to get Coca-Cola Amatul into a leadership program in Nepal. Um, you know, the board of my charity is uh, the HR director at Coca-Cola, so it's a very valuable in, but um, we're working on that. But the biggest thing I think for us next year, um, and if you want to check it out a little further, we're doing a bike ride through Nepal, so through the Himalayas. And that's very much about taking people over there, giving them a, a great adventure, but, but with a cause, and letting them know and showing them the kids that we're, we're looking after and, and where their money's actually going to. Uh, I, I guess that's about it for me. Um, the quote on the right-hand side is really one that I came across in, in early of 2013. It's certainly how I try to live, myself, live my life these days and how my wife and I live our lives. And I guess I just want to give everyone a, a standing invite in the room if you've got... Um, any type of inclination to do any volunteer or charity work or go on an adventure in any of these countries, then please come and have a chat with me or, or, or Toby afterwards. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, BBP. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much.